Hiya folks. In a recent video, I introduced you to Spring AI, a relatively new project that enables Spring Boot applications to interact with generative AI APIs such as OpenAI and Azure OpenAI. In that video, I created a simple Spring Boot application that let me ask questions about top songs for a given year, and the LLM, which was trained on that data, was happy to provide an answer, although in a couple of cases it did give an incorrect answer, unfortunately. When asking an LLM a question, there are essentially three ways it could go. The LLM absolutely knows the answer to your question based on its training and is able to definitively provide an answer. Or the LLM training isn't sufficient for it to know the answer to your question, but the LLM confidently responds with an answer that it makes up. This is what is commonly known as hallucinations. Or the LLM doesn't know the answer to your question, and it tells you that it doesn't know. Although it would be ideal if the model you're querying knew everything and was able to provide correct and trustworthy answers to all of your questions, the reality is that there's a vast amount of stuff that it simply doesn't know. Depending on which model you use, it may not have been trained on any new information from the past few years, and it certainly knows nothing about your organization's private documents and data, making it impossible to ask questions about those things. Fortunately, there is a way to give the LLM some context on which it can consult when handling queries. One way is to stuff the prompt. Add one or more documents in their entirety to the prompt along with the question being asked. Think of it as giving the LLM an open book exam and providing everything it could possibly need to be able to produce a satisfactory result. The problem with stuffing the prompt, however, is that it results in more tokens in the prompt. These tokens add up. The cost of using a, an LLM is typically calculated in terms of tokens, and so the more you put into the prompt, the higher the cost is. It costs money. The U.S. Declaration of Independence, for example, weighs in at approximately 1,695 tokens, and that's in addition to any tokens necessary to ask the question. If using GPT 3.5 Turbo, for example, you'll be paying approximately, well, uh, $0.0015 less than a penny uh, per 1,000 tokens. Now, that's not going to break the bank, but if you were to if this were part of some application that had some heavy use, it could add up. And consider that if you're using GPT-4 model, it's three cents per 1,000 tokens, so that's gonna add up even faster. Another problem with prompt stuffing is that you could encounter prompt token overflow. Depending on the model, you're limited with how many tokens can be put into a prompt. With GPT-3.5 Turbo, it's 4,000 tokens. Anything beyond that will just be dropped. And if you were to develop an application allowing users to ask anything they want about the complete works of Shakespeare, which comes in at a whopping 1.2 million tokens, then this is gonna be a problem. Of course, most LLMs are already trained on those documents, so prompt stuffing won't even be necessary. But again, there's a lot of things that LLMs aren't trained on. How can we ask questions about things the LLM doesn't know and without incurring heavy token cost or risking token overflow? That's where embeddings and vector stores come into play. Rather than give the LLM an open book exam with the entirety of the book, what if you could just provide the specific chapter, section, or even page that the LLM needs in the book to answer the question? The way this is done is by loading the context into a vector database, split it up into smaller chunks, and then later, the vector database can look up the chunks that are most similar to, and therefore most relevant to, the question being asked. Only the relevant chunks will be passed into the prompt along with the question, not the entirety of the document. This will reduce token cost and the risk of a prompt token overflow. In this video, I'm going to show how to use Spring AI to ask questions about a subject that the LLM doesn't already know about. Specifically, I'm going to ask questions about a card game called Burger Battle that is one of my family's favorite games to play. GPT 3.5 Turbo knows nothing about Burger Battle. So I'm going to need to feed it context in the form of the game rules. Then I'm going to ask questions about those rules. Now admittedly, the rules for Burger Battle are fairly brief, and so we wouldn't incur a lot of cost or, or risk token overflow anyway with that document. Even so, I'm going to show you how to use even this small document as an example of what you would do with larger documents in larger contexts to do embeddings 
and vector stores when using Spring AI. Before we get started, know that there are a lot of vector databases and other kinds of databases that can act as a vector database, including Chroma, Pinecone, and Mongo Atlas. For my demo today, I'm going to use an in-memory vector store, but when it comes to production applications, you should probably consider one of these other options. And now, let's get started. All right. To get started, I've gone ahead and created what will be the foundation for the application we're going to write in this video. Now, what I've done is I've created a simple game rules controller. It's going to handle requests that are rooted at game rules. It's going to be injected with an AI client, which comes from Spring AI. If you're not familiar with what a Spring AI client is, perhaps that's because you didn't watch my previous video. In my previous video called Introducing Spring AI, I talk all about how to set up Spring AI, how to use the AI client to ask questions, how to configure your OpenAI API key, all that stuff is covered in that video. So if, you, if you're not familiar with that, now's a good time to maybe pause this video, go back to that one, watch that, and then come back here. But if you, if, when you're ready, if you already know what an AI client is, you can see that I'm injecting an AI client in here. I'm handling a post request for game rules, and that post request is going to take as a as the body of its uh, request the rules question object, which is just a record. It's just a convenient way to carry a question as a string into my method here so that I can pass that question into the AI client's generate method, and then AI client generate will go off to OpenAI, it's, it'll do its magic, and then it'll come back with an answer in the form of a string. So let's give that a shot. Now we haven't trained the model yet on Burger Battle. We haven't done anything with embeddings or vector stores. We haven't done any of that stuff yet. But let's go ahead and ask a question now about how to play Burger Battle. Now, the way that Burger Battle works, just for those of you who are probably not familiar with it already, is it's a card game. And everybody at the beginning of the game is issued a burger they're gonna build. There's eight different burgers that they could possibly have been issued, and each one has different sets of ingredients. And as you play the game, you collect ingredient cards, and if, after you have all the eight ingredients for your burger, you win. The game ends and you're the winner. Meanwhile, though, you can create challenges for your opponents. This is called Burger Battle, after all. You can create challenges for your opponents by playing these different battle cards. For example, there is a battle card that is called Burger Bomb. And what Burger Bomb does is if you play it on one of your opponents, then Burger Bomb will destroy their burger. Basically, they have to discard all their ingredients and start over. But they have a, a defense against that. There's also a battle card called Burger Force Field. And what Burger Force Field does is if they play that on their own burger, then their, their burger is protected from any other battle cards. And so they, a, burger force, a Burger Bomb will not work on a burger that it already has a Burger Force Field on it. Now there is a question though, there is another card in the deck called, another battle card called Burger Apocalypse. And what Burger Apocalypse does is the same as a Burger Bomb, the difference, big difference being is it affects all players. It's not just a single player, all players, including the player who played it, must destroy their burger, must eliminate all of their ingredients, throw them into the, uh, what's called the trash can, or the, the um, garbage pile, whatever it's called, and start over. So the question is, this comes up a number of times, the question is, does a burger force field protect a burger from the burger apocalypse? So that's what we're going to ask. So I'm gonna use HTTP IE, because it's just easier to use HTTP IE than it is to use curl for this kind of stuff. And I'm gonna ask the question, does the burger force field card protect against burger apocalypse. There I go, it's a little difficult word to type, but okay, there we go, there's the question. Does it protect against burger apocalypse? Oh, I'm not running the application. I guess that's kind of important. It'll never work if I don't run the application, so let's move this out of the way. Go ahead and get it started. And now we'll try it. Does the burger force field car protect against burger apocalypse? And we have our answer. 
Uh, it says, I'm sorry, but as an AI language model, I do not have information on specific products or cards. Additionally, Burger Apocalypse does not seem to be a widely known event or term. It is possible that Burger Force Field and Burger Apocalypse are fictional concepts or terms specific to a certain content, t- context or game. In short, it does not know the answer. All right, great. Now we need to be able to answer this question. We need to have the LLM able to answer this question. So we are going to fill it in. We're going to feed it the context by feeding it the rules of Burger Battle. So with that said, let me move this out of the way. We'll come back and we'll ask that question again later. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start off with the very basic thing we must do, and that is we are going to provide the rules for Burger Battle. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and open up a uh, or create a new file here. We're going to call it bbrules.txt. And in that file, I have already gone to the trouble of taking the PDF for the rules of Burger Battle and ter- converting it into a text file. Now it's not very long, it's not a very big file. This is obviously not gonna demonstrate the, the challenges you might have with uh, token overflow or with you know extremely costly uh, questions about, uh, or extremely costly token counts. So uh, when you have large questions against large documents, but that's okay. Uh, it's still gonna demonstrate the, the the point fairly accurately by giving it some content that the LLM does not know about and allowing us to ask questions about it. All right, with the rules in place, I'm going to go ahead and close that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a couple of beans. I'm going to create a couple of uh, beans that we're going to use in our application to kind of make this thing all work. I'm going to put those in a new class. We're going to call it AI config. And in AI config, it's going to be a configuration class. Cool. And then I'm going to add a simple bean to start with called our, that, that's going to be our vector store. So vector store, um, call it vector store, that's fine. And I'm going to have it return a new in-memory vector store. But I have to give it an embedding client to make that work. And fortunately, we get one of those for free because the embedding clients are um, auto-configured as part of Spring AI's auto-configuration. So I'm going to have to do this, give it an embedding client. And there, there's our vector store. Great. Now I'm also going to need to load that vector store up with the documents, or in our case, the real simple document, the Burger Battle Rules. So, so to do that, I'm going to go up here and go ahead and create a private resource called BB Rules, and I'm going to annotate it with at value class path BB. Is it that? Yeah, BB rules.txt I think yeah, that's what we named it so that's going to load that into this resource awesome and then what, why is that still red cannot resolve symbol resource okay we'll fix that it's going to be that one cool and then we're going to create another bean that's going to load this thing up it's going to just simply be an application runner now we could do this any you know when the question's being asked um, but then it's costly. Every time we ask a question, we're going to have to load it up into the vector database, and that gets that gets messy. So I'm going to load it up in an application runner, a good old Spring Boot application runner, and it's going to load up the rules into the vector store. And let's see, that looks almost right. Let me see what we got going on here. Let me double check to make sure we got vector store dot add rules or add the new text loader bbrules.load. For some reason that all looks right, um, but we have an error with text loader. And well, actually I know why we have an error with text loader. Unfortunately, Spring AI does not currently have a text loader implementation. It has a JSON loader, which is one of potentially many loaders that Spring AI will eventually support. Uh, JSON loader is able to load JSON documents up and, and deal with those accordingly. But you know, it'd be very useful if we could load up a you know just a text file. It doesn't, and yet Spring AI does not yet have a text loader. So I've created one. Now it's a fairly naive implementation of text loader. I, I'll, I'll admit I, I may not know what I'm doing, and I may have made some small mistakes. But I do know for a fact that this text loader that I've created does work. So what I'm going to do is going to go ahead and create that text loader. We're going to call it text loader so that the class names match. And then I'm just gonna paste this from another project that I've built this in, and we're gonna have our text loader. Now, for those of you who wanna peek under the covers, I'll give you a quick overview of it. Ideally, 
you wouldn't have to write this class yourself. Ideally, it would be part of Spring AI and you could just take advantage of it. So, but for now, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you what it kind of looks like. The idea is we it's going to expect a resource and that resource can't be null. So we are going to give it a resource and that resource is the rules, the text file rules for Burger Battle. We're going to use a token splitter, a token text splitter, which is something uh, Spring AI does provide. And it's going to basically load all this stuff up in to via an input stream. It's going to load it all up in there and it's going to split it. Now, with a with a set with a document as simple as the burger battle rules, chances are that splitting is not going to be very interesting. It's probably going to end up not splitting really anything. But if this was a large document, let's just say I was giving it the entire contents of my book, Spring in Action. I did a rough estimate of how many tokens Spring in Action is. It's it's approximately two hundred fifty thousand tokens. It's going to split that across many different chunks, many different uh, items that are some some folks call those indexes. It's going to split that across several different chunks and then put that into the vector database when we get around to doing that over here. Um, where is that at? Yeah, right here. It's going to load that up, it's going to split it, and then we're going to load all those different chunks into the vector database. So you can see here that the load method returns a list of documents even though we only gave it one. There's a good chance, especially if you have large documents, you're going to actually get back multiple little documents that are going to be loaded into the vector store. All right. With that said, we've got some of the basics out of the way. Let's take a look and see how we can actually use this. I'm going to have to create a, a service here. I don't really have to create the service. I could put this all in the controller if I wanted to, but it's nice to shove it off into a service so it's easier to find. And I'm going to call it Game Rag Service. Now, what RAG is is an acronym. It's short for Retrieval Augmented Generation. It's essentially saying we're going to retrieve some information that's going to augment what we send to the AI so that it can give us a better answer when it does its generation. So RAG is, is Retrieval Augmented Generation, so I'm just calling this my game RAG service. In my game RAG service, I'm going to annotate this first off as a service just so that it's picked up by uh, Spring Boot or, or Spring Auto uh, Discovery or, or Auto Wiring. And then I'm going to go ahead and give it um, a, a constructor. It's going to see public game rag service. It's going to take an AI client because I'm going to need it to do that. I'm going to give it an AI client. I'm also going to give it my vector store. And of course, I'm going to do what any good person would do is I'm going to assign those to um, the things they need to be assigned to. So I'm going to say this.ai client equal AI client, this.vector store. Oh, I see what the problem is. I was wondering why some of the code completion wasn't happy. This.vector store equal vector store. Great. I'm going to need some variables for those, some fields to hold those things. And so the IDE was helpful with that. Great. We have all that stuff in place. Now I'm going to create another uh, method in here called public, and it's going to return a generation object. If you're not familiar with what a generation object is, that's something I did talk about in my, my previous video. So go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. I'm going to have it say called generate response. It's going to take a message from the user, which is essentially the question about the game. It's going to take a message from the user as a parameter, and I'm going to do a couple of things here. First off, I'm going to go find the documents that are similar to the question. So the question was asked about Burger Battle. It was asked, can a burger force field protect my burger from a burger apocalypse? So something like that. I need to go find all the documents in the vector store that are similar to that. Now, this is not a perfect case. This is this is uh, kind of like search. In, in a way, it's kind of like kind of simple search. I'm taking the prompt that the user gave and I'm asking it, to search a set of documents and produce the ones that are most similar to it. Thereby, the ones that are most similar are probably the ones that are most relevant, and those are the ones we're going to be giving to the LLM when we ask the question. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to create a new vector store store retriever, and that vector store retriever is going to take as a parameter a vector store, and from that vector store retriever, I'm going to retrieve based on whatever the question was, whatever the message was from the user. 
And then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna assign it to a list of similar documents. So there we go. I'm gonna break this up on another line just so it's a little bit easier to read, there we go. And then, now that I have a list of similar documents, I need to form these into the, the message that we're going to give uh, in the prompt to the LLM. So first off, the simplest thing we can do is we say the user message. The user message is what the user said. So user message equal new user message message. So that's what's passed in. That's the question. But now the other side of this is that the list of similar documents, that's something that the system is providing. That's something not that the user is providing. That's something that the system, the application itself is providing. So we need to create a system message. So I'm going to say message. Make sure we're getting the AI version of message. Message, system message equal, and I have a special method we're going to write in a minute to deal with this called get system message. We're going to pass in those similar documents and that's going to produce our system message. So let's write that get system message um, fun, uh, method right now. So private message, oops, message, get system message. We're going to pass in that list of documents called similar documents and then in here we're going to say okay string documents equal similar documents dot stream and we're going to basically do a functional streaming across this list of documents and we're going to say okay here's what we're going to do we're going to say we're going to take each entry in there which probably is only one but each entry and we're going to say entry dot get content dot collect oops what did I mistype entry something oh yeah curly brace not not parentheses there we go entry uh, no I did that right stream oh I forgot to type map my bad map entry there we go now one of these days I'm going to learn how to program entry dot get content now we got it dot collect oops dot collect and we're going to collect it using a collectors dot joining uh, with a um, line break. So there's a lot of stuff that just went on right there. We need to make sure we get the right collections in here. Cool. I'm going to break that into another line or two just to make it a little bit easier to read. Let's see. Maybe... Oops. Here's what I want to do. Let's... It's hard to sometimes figure out how to break lines when you're dealing with functional programming, but I think that's probably as good as we're going to get. So it's going to cycle over that list of entries. It's going to take the content of those documents. It's going to join them together with a line break between them. That's essentially all we're doing right there. All right, with that said, now I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to create a oops, system prompt template. Now, if you're, if you're not familiar, familiar with what prompt templates are, we talked about those in the last video as well. Specifically, I'm going to create one here. Um, called system prompt template. Of course, I have to do a little typing. It is Java after all? That's going to take the system game prompt, which we, which is our our string that is our template, and we're going to feed that in to create this template. Now, what does that template look like? All right. Well, that's going to be loaded in as a as a file as a resource, similar to the way we loaded in our our documents. So where the system game prompt comes from is it's going to be loaded in as a resource similar to how we loaded in the document itself. So to do that, I'm going to come up here and declare another variable called of type, whoops, helps if I could type, of type resource. We're going to have one of those and we're going to call this system game prompt. And where that's going to come from is it's going to be at value, just like before, at value and Make sure I get my, my notes on this right. We're going to load that from the class path from the root. We'll go ahead and do it from the root, and we're going to call it system game prompt.st. Okay? So under resources, I'm going to create a new file called system game prompt.st. And in system game prompt, I'm going to define exactly the type of thing we're going to ask, the system is going to ask or, or send when it comes to uh, talking about the, this game. So I am going to copy from an example I already have and we'll talk about it. It says you're, existing, you're assisting with questions about a specific board game. 
use the information from the document section, which is down here, and that's where the placeholder for documents is. Use the information from the document section to provide an accurate provide accurate answers. If you're unsure, simply state that you don't know. In other words, this is what the system is going to tell the LLM when the user asks a question. It's going to basically set kind of the rules for uh, for how to answer questions about board game rules. All right, now back over to our rag service, our game rag service. Now that we have all that in place. Um, we have all this right. Why is it not liking joining? Did I did I do a typo there? Let me check my notes. Collectors. I think I may have got the oh it's collections, not collect. I did that wrong. There we go. Now let's fix that. Collectors. Dot joining. Still not liking it. Oh, I I I, I kind of overdid it a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Fix that. There. It's even easier to read now. So it is a big win on doing that. All right, so uh, we're gonna gonna do that. We've got the um, documents all streamed and, and separated by line breaks. We're tell we got the system uh, prompt all ready to go. So all we need to do now is we need to say oops, return system prompt template dot create message, and instead of just saying create message, we're gonna pass into it a map of and this is where we're going to set the document. So document, documents. All right. Now, do I, I do want to do one thing. I want to make sure my, that this matches what's in the template. Uh, yes, it's plural. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure it's plural here as well. Oops, documents. There we go. Now, when I call this, I've got system, message, system message, equal get system message. And we're ready to go send this off. So I'm going to say prompt, prompt equal new prompt, list dot of. I'm going to pass in the system message. I'm also going to pass in the user message. And helps if I put a T on the end there. And I'm going to say, OK, AI client dot generate, passing in that prompt. I'm going to assign that to an AI response because I really don't need everything about the AI response in there. I just simply need uh, the text of it. So I'm going to say return response.get generation which is going to have the text in it. And or wait, is that what I wanted? Get generation dot get text. That's what I wanted. And actually up here I realized that I don't need to return a generation. I can just return the string and we can be good with that. So that looks good. We got a generate response. All of the heavy lifting is done. So just a quick review of what we've done. We're gonna we have a generate response method that's gonna take a message, which is typically a question from the user. It's gonna go find all these similar documents out of the vector store. It's gonna use those similar documents to create a system message, which follows the template we created over here. It is gonna take the user message along with that system message and create a prompt. It's gonna send that prompt to the AI client. The AI client's gonna send it to the LLM for us. The LLM's gonna respond with an answer and we are gonna get some text out of that and return it. All's good here. All right, cool. Let's go back over to our controller now and let's change it. So then saying, instead of calling AI client directly, we don't really need that. What we're gonna call instead is the game rag service. We'll just call it service for short. Um, Go change a few things. We don't need that AI client, so we're going to replace it with the RAG service. And we're going to say service generate response. And now we have all the pieces in place. Let's see if this works. So DevTools should restart for us. But if I'm going to be a little impatient, I'm going to go ahead and restart for us as well. There we go. And now, now that we've taught, our application has taught by way of uh, embeddings and via a vector store, let's ask the question again, now that it knows how to play Burger Battle. So we asked the question before, let's ask the same question again. Does the Burger Force Field card protect against Burger Apocalypse? No, the Burger Force Fill card does not protect against Burger Apocalypse. When Burger Apocalypse is played, all players' ingredients, including your own, are destroyed regardless of protection. Well, that's fantastic. It actually gave us an answer. Now, some people I play with are probably not playing it right. We actually let the Burger Force Fill card 
uh, protect against burger apocalypse. But no, no, the official rules explicitly state via, and, and we've confirmed that via asking it with our uh, Spring AI application, Burger Force Field Card does not protect against Burger Apocalypse. It destroys everybody's burgers. You're essentially wiping the slate clean. Let's ask it another question, though. So does the Burger Force Field Card protect against Burger Bomb? Yes, the Burger Force Field Card does protect against your burger against all from all battle cards, including the Burger Bomb. Now, suddenly, this sounds a little bit inconsistent with what it said up here. This says all battle cards. This says... It doesn't protect against Burger Apocalypse. Small little detail. Uh, when, when it's otherwise not clear, I tend to favor the one that is very specific against this versus the one that more generically says all battle cards. So this this is the reason why sometimes when we play, we allow battle we allow the Burger First Fill card to protect against Burger Apocalypse. But um, this rule says no, you're not supposed to. Okay, let's ask it just a couple more questions just for grins and giggles just to see this <clears throat> see this thing work. Let's ask it, how many how many players can play? Now, I already know the answer to that. It's, um, officially, it's two to six players, although we have played it with seven. It gets a little tricky because ingredients start becoming kind of sparse at some point. But how many can play? Two to six players can play Burger Battle. All right, let's try one more question just for grins. What is the... Um, that looks good card. There is no card called that looks good provided in the information. Why? Maybe I'm remembering it wrong. Let's, let's see what, what our rules say. We have several rules in here called, um, oh, yours looks good. That's the name of it. So let's, let's see what the yours looks good is. The Yours Looks Good card is a battle card in the game Burger Battle. When played, it allows you to trade your burger and all your ingredients with another player, including the added battle cards. Well, there you go. So now, even though GPT 3.5 Turbo does not know how to play Burger Battle, we've been able to give it information from our own document to tell it how to play Burger Battle so that when we ask questions about it, we it, it will know how to answer. We can ask rules clarifying questions about the game. Kind of awesome if you ask me. Now, once again, Burger Battle is a fairly simple game. The rules are fairly simple um, and therefore quite brief. In fact, the entire file is only like 61 lines, uh, not including white, well, including some white space in there. So it's, you know, whether there's any value in doing it with this or not, I, I, I don't know. But for, you know, more complex games, uh, something like, I wouldn't say Catan's terribly complex, but there are a lot of uh, little caveats in the rules. Games like Catan or Carcassonne might be really interesting games to throw the rules at uh, and see if you can ask some rules clarifying questions with. Furthermore, um, it's not just about board games. It could be about any any document you happen to have or any series of documents you happen to have and you would like to ask questions about it. You can load those in uh, to your vector database, select the ones that are most relevant to the question, and then use those the relevant documents, the similar documents, as context for the user when they're asking questions. All right. With that said, let's have a little bit of recap. In this video, I expanded on the introduction to Spring AI that I gave in my previous video to show how to provide context in a prompt so that you can ask questions about things that the LLM hasn't been trained on. Although we use the rules from a very simple game, the technique applies equally well if used with larger documents or with many documents. By splitting the documents up into smaller pieces and using a vector database to find the most relevant information, we are able to avoid costly interactions with the LLM by minimizing the number of tokens in the context and also avoid a prompt token overflow when the number of tokens exceeds the maximum for the model. And with that said, thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Here's where you can find me on the social medias. Here is where you can, uh, here, here's my books you should check out. Spring in Action, 6th edition, covers all the great stuff you might want to know about Spring Framework and Spring Boot. And Build Talking Apps for Alexa is going to help you learn how to build voice interactions for the Amazon Alexa platform. But if you don't remember anything else from this slide, remember the website. Habuma.com is where you're going to find 
all the information about me, where I'm speaking, where I live on social media, my books, other videos I've produced, and, and things like that. So again, with that said, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.